Right. I, oh, good. That's great. I think we're going to be um, able to start now. Hang on one tick. Uh, newsletter. So I'm hoping that they'll move into another section. Sorry, everyone. Um, welcome to the Irish American Heritage Museum. We're live from the museum. I thought I'd be at home, but I'm glad I stayed because there was a terrible thunder and lightning and heavy rain shower, and the museum is under about five inches of water uh, throughout my office and the main lobby and um, almost going into the library. Mm -hmm. Do you want me? They wanted to do here? No. Are you okay? Are you okay? Okay. Nick is my favorite. I told Brian Rowe not to come, that we've enough now. I told Brian Rowe not to come. Yeah, thank you. Okay, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'll delete this bit at the end. We'll edit all of this. <laughs> I'm this close to crying though, so. Um, anyway, anyway, we're delighted to have with us tonight, um, and I was talking to Brian earlier on today, um, Dr. Brian Murphy and Dr. Donica. Now, Donica, hang on, shall I get your proper name? Obekon, is that right? Oh, back on, yeah. Back on, yeah. Good. Um, so, Do Donica is Professor of Politics at the School of Law and Government at DCU, which was across the city from where I went. I went to UCD, as did uh, Brian. And he lectures on the post-Soviet region, uh, foreign policy and Irish studies. He has several publications, including Destiny of the Soldiers, Fianna Fáil, Irish Republicanism and the IRA between 1926 and 1973, Political Communication in Ireland and From Partition to Brexit, the Irish Government and Northern Ireland, which uh, he doesn't know this, but we're going to have him back to talk about that later on in the year. <laughs> um, Dr. Brian Murphy is a lecturer in the College of Arts and Tourism at, at uh, the Technical University in Dublin, and he works also at the Clinton Summer School at UCD, and he'll talk to you about that. Um, so Brian has several publications too, and is working at the moment on... Um, Oh, maybe not working, already published, a, a book about Douglas Hyde, Ireland's first president. We were talking today about him because he came to America a lot uh, for his work on the Gaelic League. He has also written uh, Brian Lenehan in Calm and Crisis about one of the Irish ministers for finance. And of course, now this From Whence I Came, the Kennedy Legacy. So we're delighted to have our speakers. And uh, apologies for all that kerfuffle at the start. We are we are underwater here at the museum. So this will work. Um, Brian is going to give, I believe, a kind of a short introduction with some PowerPoint and stuff. So I'll spotlight him and he'll share. And then uh, we'll have a conversation, Donica and Brian and myself, about the book kind of and, and just various organic things. I'll try and keep my portion, you know, as quick and quiet as possible in case there's any questions from the audience. So um, without further ado, <laughs> thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. And um, you can share your screen now, Brian, and, and I'll mute myself here in case there's another shark back noise. Or, yeah, and Donica, you chime in whenever you want to. <laughs> That's great. Can people, people see that okay? I hope. Yeah, great. So I'm muting myself again because you can hear. Okay, and, th and, th and th thank you, thank you, Elizabeth, and uh, uh, th thanks to thanks to the audience at, at home for, for for zooming in as well. I know you're uh, I know you're having uh, trying uh, circumstances, Elizabeth, with, with with the leak as well. So I know when we spoke earlier on um, that really what you want to do is have a an organic conversation with myself and Donica about the book, but uh, we decided maybe just to show people a few a few slides. And really, what I'm going to do is. Uh, just go through the, the slides, the pictures very, very quickly, just to give people maybe an overview of what's uh, an overview of what's in the in the book. Maybe a, a whistle a whistle stop of some of the highlights, or at least some of the the contents of, of the book. Um, the book is called From Whence I Came: The Kennedy Legacy, Ireland and America. And I know you, I, I know that you're going to make copies of the book available in the in the museum store as well, uh, which which were which were very grateful grateful for. The origins of the book. Uh, the book comes out of at the Kennedy Summer School. And um, I suppose uh, the, the, the summer school is uh, an Irish concept. Sometimes when I say summer school to an American audience, uh, they think that I, I'm talking about remedial classes for people who didn't do so well during the normal term time. But in fact, the, a summer school is an Irish conference. Um, it's, uh, we, we build it a festival of Irish and American history, culture, and politics. And the Kennedy Summer School, named after the Kennedy family, takes place in New Ross County, Wexford. And New Ross uh, County, Wexford, New Ross is the ancestral home of the Kennedy family. It's where JFK's great-grandfather got on a boat 
in 1848. He walked from a place called Dungamstown, uh, just outside the town of New Ross, about five or six miles outside the town of New Ross, walked to the port of New Ross and got on, got on the boat for America and created a, created a dynasty. So our summer school there, every year we have high profile guests from across Ireland and from across Europe and from across the United States, people who come and talk about uh, the Kennedy legacy, but also about wider Irish and American politics uh, and history. And just the picture there, I think, is from our 2016 summer school, just uh, to give you, a, 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 I suppose, an inkling of some of the type of guests we have. The man on the far left is Tad Devine, who uh, is, uh, Tad Devine's a well-known figure in American, in the backroom of American politics, uh, Dr. Tad Devine, who ran, uh, who ran Bernie Saunders election campaign in 2016. And the man beside Tad is Kevin O'Malley, who was uh, the, the Irish, uh, the, the United States uh, ambassador to Ireland. And uh, the man point, pointing towards the, sky, towards the skyline or towards the horizon is of course Martin O'Malley, Martin O'Malley who was um, the governor of Maryland and he was a, a, a candidate for the Democratic uh, nomination for president in 2016. And the man on the far right is, is Kevin Cullen, who's a, a, a journalist with the Boston Globe and a, a proud Irish American. So we're always bringing over high profile Irish Americans to talk to us about American politics, but particularly people talking about the legacy of, uh, of the Kennedys as, as well. And I suppose the summer school has been running for uh, since uh, tw 2012. It's been running for nine years. And over those nine years, there has been great papers delivered to the summer school about the Kennedy legacy, about the Kennedy, Kennedy family and their contribution. And I was always of the mind that these should be compiled into a book, but never really got round to it. And in 2019, myself and Donica, the picture on the left of, is myself and, uh, and Donica at 80, 83 Beale Street, Brooklyn, Massachusetts, just outside Boston. And of course, the significance of that address is um, that is the house that John, John, John F. Kennedy was born in in 1917. And my, myself and Donica were at uh, a conference in Boston uh, representing our own uh, universities uh, independently. And uh, we, we took a trip in between the conference proceedings out to Brookline and visited the JFK house. And like a uh, good Irishman after that trip, we went, to, we went to a bar and we had a couple of drinks and we spoke about the Kennedys and their legacy and their connection to Ireland. And we decided that we would uh, draw together the different articles, uh, the different papers that had been delivered at the Kennedy Summer School and put them into a, a book. Um, the book is dedicated to the man on the right, uh, the late great Noel Whelan, um, who anyone in Ireland, particularly anyone involved in Irish politics would know Noel very well. Uh, Noel was a barrister, uh, a high profile lawyer, but also a high profile newspaper columnist wrote a political column, uh, a must read political column in the Irish Times, uh, the most, maybe the most prestigious newspaper in Ireland. And, and Noel wrote every Saturday. He was somebody who was very much involved in political life and discussion. He was a, a, a friend of Donica's and a very good friend of mine uh, as well. And Noel unfortunately passed away in 2019 at, at, at 50 years of age from cancer. So the book is dedicated to Noel's uh, memory. Noel was the founder of the Kennedy Summer School and all the royalties from the book are being donated to the, commu to the community hospital in New Ross and that money will be donated in, in, Noel's, in, in Noel's name anyway. So hopefully something good will come from that book which has been a, a labor of love for myself and Donica. Um, I wouldn't like anyone to think that the book is just about JFK because it's not. It's about the wider Ken Kennedy family it particularly step, tells the story of Patrick and Bridget uh, Kennedy, Patrick Kennedy and Bridget, Bridget Murphy. Patrick Kennedy, who, as I said, he boarded a ship in New Ross in October 1848 during the Irish potato famine and sailed to America and gave rise to uh, a political dynasty, a, a political dynasty. He married another Irish immigrant, a lady called Bridget Murphy in, uh, in, in Boston, Massachusetts. And we don't have a picture of Bridget Murphy. Sometimes history is seen very much as his, his story. And Bridget uh, has been written out of history, but her contribution to the Kennedy family is immense because Patrick sadly uh, didn't survive. Uh, he survived less than 10 years living in America. He had a very, very hard life. And uh, it was Bridget's entrepreneurial skills and her drive and determination that set the Kennedy family onto the path of 
uh, prosperity and beginning to thrive in the, the, the United States. And um, the book also looks at uh, Joseph P. Kennedy, who was the grandson of Bridget and Patrick and uh, the, father of, the father of JFK. And I suppose the journey and the upward trajectory of the Kennedy family um, arriving, uh, Patrick Kennedy arriving as a penniless emigrant in 1848, and his grandson uh, skipping forward two generations is one of the wealthiest men in the United States. He's a billionaire by the late 1920s, uh, early 1930s. And his resources, as Dunica has written about, particularly in the book, his resources are essential to JFK's uh, presidential bid and to the ultimate success of, of that bid. Of that, of that bid. The book does talk about the, the fabled 1,000 days or 1,036 days and goes through, um, I suppose, the, the highs and the lows of, 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 the Kennedy, uh, of the Kennedy presidency. And the picture, uh, particularly on the right, uh, JFK signing the nuclear test ban treaty on the 7th of October, 1963. Um, that was actually the achievement that he believed was the, the biggest achievement of his administration. I might dispute that there was one or, the, one or two other things that I thought that were maybe even bigger achievements, but that was uh, the achievement that he put the, he, he put the, he put the most uh, stock on. Um, and of course, the book focuses very much on the special relationship with, our, with, with Ireland. Picture uh, on the left is uh, just running up to St. Patrick's Day in 1963, and the, the man with the bowl of shamrocks about to present it to, to, to President Kennedy is a man called Thomas J. Kiernan. Thomas J. Kiernan was the Irish ambassador in Washington at the time, and he, more than anyone else, made sure that that historic, iconic visit of JFK to Ireland in the summer of 1963 happened. Uh, he arrived in Ireland on the 26th of June, 1963, fly flying in from Berlin, where he made that famous Ich bin ein Berliner speech. And on the 27th of June, uh, his second day in, in Ireland, he went to County Wexford, um, the county that his uh, ancestors had, uh, had emigrated from, and laid a wreath at the John Barry Memorial. John Barry, of course, was the founder of, uh, founder of the American Na Navy. And even though, even with JFK's passing, um, the enduring links between the Kennedys and Ireland remain. Um, Senator, uh, Senator Ted Kennedy, who was first elected to the Senate, to uh, JFK's old Senate seat in 1962, he was somebody who immersed himself all through his career in Irish issues and issues around immigration, around the Irish economy, but particularly around the conflict in Northern Ireland and the peace process in Northern Ireland. And Ted Kennedy, from the onset of the troubles in Northern Ireland in 1969, right through to the IRA ceasefire in 1994, and the Good Friday Agreement, uh, which was brokered by uh, the Irish Prime Minister, or Taoiseach Bertie O'Hearn, and Tony Blair, the British uh, Prime Minister, but also through the good offices of President Clinton and US Senator George Clinton, and also, or, or sorry, US Senator um, George Mitchell, and also, uh, of course, Senator Ted Kennedy, all instrumental players in the, in the Good Friday Agreement, which has brought peace to the island of Ireland. And at the summer school in 2018, on the 50th anniversary, of the assassination of Robert Kennedy. Um, we were privileged to speak to Kerry Kennedy, uh, one of Bobby Kennedy's daughters, who's very much involved in uh, human rights and promoting human rights around uh, in the United States and across, across the globe. And Kerry has wrote a very compelling chapter in the book about the Kennedy's relationships with Ireland and how, um, I suppose, um, how the connection with Ireland has shaped uh, the political leanings and the political viewpoints of, 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 of the Kennedy family. And the book then deals with the wider influence of the Kennedy legacy. Um, there's a fantastic chapter in the book, I would argue probably uh, the, the most brilliantly written chapter in the book by a man called Cody Keenan. Um, not surprisingly, it's brilliantly written because Cody Keenan is a brilliant writer. He was the speechwriter to Barack Obama, who in, in many ways, uh, was probably the most articulate uh, president in terms of speeches, maybe since John F. Kennedy himself. And Cody Keenan uh, was uh, started his career, uh, which ended up in the White House writing speeches for Barack Obama, actually started his career working as a young man in Ted Kennedy's office. And uh, the book also includes a chapter from a man called Bob Shrum, who is a legend in the back room of democratic politics in the, in the United States, 
uh, Bob Strom has ran uh, hundreds of, uh, of campaigns for gover governatorial campaigns, campaigns for the Senate, campaigns for Congress, uh, was also the campaign manager for Al Gore in, in 2000. He was uh, Ted Kennedy's uh, press secretary for many years, a very close friend of Ted Kennedy's, and he wrote the iconic speech that Ted Kennedy delivered at the 1980 De Democratic uh, Convention in Madison Square Gardens, a speech that many of you may remember. It's a speech called The Dream Shall Never, Never Die, and Bob Strom was the author of that, and he writes about his life and time and his association with uh, Ted Kennedy in the in the book as well. So that's a little bit about the book, just to give people a flavor about it. But I think uh, we can go into much more detail in terms of the themes in the book uh, now, because I know Elizabeth, Elizabeth would uh, like like to have a chat with us, and uh, I want to give Donica an opportunity to, to 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 chat as well. He's much more fun to listen to than I am. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, so that that's great. I think that was a, a very good like overview. Um, so that's exactly right. Like I, I wanted to, you know, sell the sizzle and not the steak, as my father says, um, in terms of, you know, talking about the book. But I think that is an important distinction. And Donica, maybe you can speak to this, that the book is not necessarily about, you know, the itinerary of the Kennedys in Ireland. It's more to do with the, like the political legacy. And so today when we were talking or when Brian and I were talking, you know, one of the things that came up was the evolution that Kennedy himself sort of went through, you know, that like he was almost kind of bullied, you could say, by his own generals and things at the, you know, the Bay of Pigs, and then this evolution right through to even like maybe how he um, changed his mind on certain things. You know, he grew, I suppose, with civil rights, uh, the Vietnam issue, maybe. So that's one thing I wanted to discuss. And the other thing I wanted to discuss, and this might be more your wheelhouse, was the actual election. Um, you know, and I was listening to the pundits last night on the news, and they said. Uh, you know, Nixon and himself sat down and shared a cup, a, a glass, they had a mug of Coke each or, or a bottle of Coke each. And, you know, even though it was a, quite a close vote, Nixon did the right thing. And, and so if you contrast that with where we are today, which we won't, <laughs> um, but, you know, it's an interesting phenomenon like that it was such a close election in one way. And, and you know, the, the old um, saying that if you heard it on the radio, Nixon won, but if you watched it on TV, you know, Kennedy won. So do you want to address that issue, Donic? I think that's more your wheelhouse. Sure. I mean, it was obviously a seminal election and, and the big takeaway for many people is, is the rather simple and well-told story of John F. Kennedy being the youngest ever uh, president, and that's a record that's still held to this day, um, 43 years of age. And, um, and a big contrast, of course, with the current uh, incumbent. And, yeah. um, and of course, the, um, the the first Catholic, and that of course is is something that was a, a record that he held until the election of Joe Biden, who was the second Catholic elected uh, to, to to the U.S. presidency. And he had, of course, the 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 um, the, 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 the kind of the cloud of Al Smith's um, attempt uh, in 1928. Al Smith was uh, of Irish Catholic stock. He was urban based in, in the liberal Northeast. But his campaign was overwhelmed uh, by bigotry in 1928. And, and John F. Kennedy was, of course, determined that there would be no repeat of 1928. But in all other aspects, I mean, we tend to concentrate on the Catholicism, and that did make him an outsider. But in, in all other ways, the Kennedys were insiders. Uh, as, as Brian pointed out, I mean, uh, his father, um, you know, was a multi-billionaire uh, by the 1930s. Uh, he had made his money uh, in, in, in property, in, in, in real estate, in the movie industry, in stocks and shares before that. He got out just in time before mm. the Wall Street crash. So, you know, I mean, John F. Kennedy's rise in politics seems meteoric. I mean, like he was a, a congressman in his late 20s. He was a senator in his mid-30s. He was president, as I said, um, at, at the age of 43. But that's inexplicable without the, the wealth and resources and the networks that were there for him and at his disposal. Uh, he very much had presidential ambition foisted upon him by his father. Now, he did grow into the role, there's no doubt about that, but as, you, as you're probably aware, many of your audience might be aware, he wasn't even the first choice. I mean, his elder yeah. brother was the first choice for the father. Uh, it, the father himself, by the way, did have presidential ambitions, but he, he realized at a certain stage in his life that he, it wasn't going to be him, and he passed it on to his children. But the elder brother, of course, died uh, in, in World War II, then it was John F. Kennedy himself 
Uh, and, and of course, when John F. Kennedy was assassinated in, in, in 1963, that ambition then passed on to his brother, Bobby Kennedy. And when he himself was assassinated, of course, the Kennedy ambitions fell on to Ted Kennedy, uh, mm -hmm. who had a long, of course, and stellar career in the Senate, but tried to, unsuccessfully to run for the presidency in, in 1980. But actually, when you look at 1960, um, the outsider in many respects was Richard Nixon, if you take a personal background. I mean, Richard Nixon was of, of relatively poor Quaker stock who, who, who made his way up in, in rather challenging conditions, uh, certainly the, the, the very opposite of the Kennedys. But a lot of things went wrong for him in that campaign. He got sick. Um, you know, people often think of John F. Kennedy as, the, as one of uh, his image as one of youthful vigor. Um, but there was only three years between himself and Nixon in terms of age. And, uh, and Nixon's normally robust health failed him during the campaign. He spent a couple of weeks in hospital. He, he was wedded to this uh, campaign pledge of visiting all 50 states during the campaign. Uh, mm -hmm. Alaska and Hawaii had only recently joined. And that meant that in his last week, because of the fact that the illness had set him back uh, by some, some time, uh, in his last week he was campaigning, uh, uh, or rather in the penultimate week, he was campaigning in Alaska where there were only three electoral college votes. Oh, was, Kennedy, Kennedy was, 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 was stomping all the, all the key marginals uh, with heavily populated areas. Uh, also, of course, their choice of vice president, um, you know, Nixon chooses Henry Cabot Lodge, who arguably didn't add a thousand votes anywhere in the country for his campaign. Uh, he was the man, of course, who uh, Kennedy defeated in 1952 in Massachusetts for the Senate. And, um, and therefore, you know, there was, a, there was that kind of, I guess, history of, of, of competition between them that had been in Kennedy's favor, whereas Kennedy chose Lyndon Johnson, which in many respects um, was an unpopular choice within the Kennedy camp. They had, of course, contested the uh, Democratic nomination against each other. But Kennedy was wise enough to realize that uh, they were perfectly complementary with each other. Um, everything that Kennedy was not, Johnson was, being from the South, being experienced in the Senate and whatnot. And, uh, and of course, it was, it was then a dream ticket. And it, you mentioned, of course, the television debates. It was the first time that there were nationwide television debates in 1960. And, and, and Eisenhower, you know, advised Nixon not to do it. He said, you have nothing to gain here. You know, Kennedy is the challenger. He needs the publicity. But Nixon was so assured of his own um, prowess as a debater that he took it on. Um, and he, as is well known now, he, uh, the, the battle of the image uh, was lost by Nixon in the first debate. He, uh, he didn't prepare. Uh, mm -hmm. He treated it as a normal campaign, um, you know, uh, talk. And, um, and, and Kennedy was, 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 was facing the cameras, whereas Nixon addressed uh, the, the, the questioners, the journalists, the audience. Uh, Kennedy focused on the cameras, which was, of course, the electorate. 70 million Americans were viewing it that night. That was, again, uh, a major record. And even though Nixon did make up ground in the second and third and, and fourth debates, arguably the, the image had been left uh, at the beginning that Kennedy was somebody to be reckoned with because he was the one who had to overcome the image of being uh, youthful, inexperienced, and, and also, I guess, born with a silver spoon in his mouth, that he didn't actually have a substance. And the, mm -hmm. the debates kind of put that argument to bed. And uh, so there's a lot of areas, I, I'm, there's a lot more I could cover there, I guess, but it was a very tight debate, uh, sorry, tight um, election race. And it came down at the end just to a few marginal uh, votes in a few states, uh, Illinois in particular. Uh, and there was a lot of debate about uh, whether some corners had been cut uh, in Illinois, uh, but also in, in, in other states, Texas as well was swung narrowly. And then that was, of course, Lyndon Johnson's uh, home state. If Lyndon Johnson hadn't been chosen as vice president, Texas probably wouldn't have been one for the Kennedy camp. And he overcame the religion issue. Uh, even during the Democratic race, um, he by winning uh, states like uh, West Virginia, which was 95 percent Protestant, these were key, mm. um, you know, symbolic victories for somebody who had to prove that the American people were ready uh, to vote for a Catholic. There's a certain parallel, I think, with the Obama campaign in 2008, where you might remember, because it's all in our memory, or most of our memories, I hope, um, that, you know, essentially a part of the campaign, an integral part of the Obama campaign was America proving that it was a mature democracy, mature enough to overcome a legacy of, 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 of racial, uh, racially based bigotry, uh, of racism. And, and that by and, and that, of course, I mean, because the majority of people, of course, in America are not black. So most of the people who voted for Obama 
uh, voted for him, um, they, they were white. They were wanting to demonstrate in many respects, and that was certainly part of the campaign, to demonstrate that people uh, could overcome uh, that legacy. And Kennedy did the same. He said to people directly, he said, look, uh, my, my, my brother who died in World War II, nobody asked him his religion when he fought and died for America. And if people are saying that I can't be president because I'm Catholic, it means that there are 40 million Americans who've lost their chance of being president on the day that they're baptized and that America is better than that. So he laid down kind of a gauntlet to American democracy, challenging voters to prove their, their lack of bigotry. And it, it worked in 1960 as it worked in 2008. Mm, yeah, that's a good point. Um, Brian, um, so if you wanted to tackle the first, you know, kind of question about how he evolved in the course of his political career, um, you know, from maybe those early days and then with the Cuban Missile Crisis, and I think some of that does tie in too, maybe with, you know, the Catholic identity and anti-socialism and all that, but, you know, he did have, particularly towards the end of his presidency, like, uh, you know, and, and you could argue Bobby was maybe more to the left again, and certainly Ted might have been years later, you know, were the Kennedys all of them evolving like or becoming a little bit more progressive you know uh, so jfk you know he has this 1036 days to sort of prove himself i suppose but we do see an evolution with him and then if you want to speak to the broader family too you know you can yeah i mean i, I absolutely i mean i think i think there was a, a, a an evolution in terms of uh progressive uh politics but also maybe a, a, an evolution i think uh when jfk came into office uh, he came into office as, as very much a, a Cold War warrior. Um, I mean, uh, he he certainly took a harder line uh, in, in terms of facing down communism. Even 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 the Nixon, there wasn't there wasn't a lot between them. But if anything, uh, during the presidential campaign, I think uh, Kennedy Kennedy took a harder line, uh, took a very hard line in terms of in terms of Cuba, and maybe didn't realize when he was taking that hard line when he got into office. Uh, in, in, when he got into office and was inaugurated president in 1961, one of the one of the first things that came across his desk was uh, this, the the CIA plan. Uh, I, I think called Operation Mongoose, where uh, there was a plan uh, to to invade to invade Cuba, and that uh, that that invasion, the Bay of Pigs, ultimately happened on the 17th of April, uh, 1961, and. Um, I suppose Eisenhower, Eisenhower had used the CIA, CIA to overthrow problematic regimes in Iran uh, in the 1950s, I think in 1953, and in Guatemala in 1954. Um, and Kennedy was presented with this plan when he came in, it, it, when he came into office. The plan was so far advanced um, when it was presented to him that uh, he felt a new rookie president he, he felt maybe uh, it was impossible to cancel it. It had gone too far down the line. Also, many of his advisors, although they were actually skeptical of the plan, um, they withheld their criticism and maybe they were still trying to feel out uh, their place in the pecking order with the president and uh, they weren't as vocal maybe or going to the president and telling him things that they thought he didn't want to hear and they didn't tell him their skepticism about the plan and whether wh whether this plan would work. And um, the Bay of Pigs was a military disaster. Uh, uh, 1,400 um, Cuban Cuban exiles uh, trained by the CIA, and uh, I, I mean they they were essentially uh, annihilated, uh, captured by, uh, by 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 Castro, by Castro's forces, and it was a disaster. I mean Kennedy uh, looked at himself after this. In fairness to him, uh, he took responsibility. Uh, he publicly took responsibility for it. He uh, made the decision very quickly. Uh, the CIA wanted him to give a, 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 to to a sanction U.S. airstrikes and um, to give cover to uh, when the invasion started to go wrong by the exiles. But he felt that he couldn't involve the U.S. Uh, military in this. He felt that this would damage U.S. prestige. But of course, it all came out that there, that there was U.S. involvement in terms of tra training the training the exile. And in fairness to Kennedy, he took responsibility. He did put his hands up. Um, he had a famous uh, line where he said, victory has a hundred fathers, but defeat is an orphan. Um, but behind closed doors, he was livid, livid with himself. He kept on asking how he could have been so stupid to have gone ahead with this plan, why he didn't question it more, but livid with his advisors that nobody told him this was a bad idea. And he said that he, he said 
Um, very annoyed with the, the CIA, who he felt had led him astray. He said he was going to smash the CIA into a thousand pieces. He didn't do that, but Alan, Alan Dallas, who was the long-serving director of the CIA, he paid a price, and the deputy director, uh, Richard Bissell, uh, who, who, who was the brains, uh, if, if brains was the appropriate word, behind the plan, uh, the, the invasion plan of, of, of Cuba, they both paid a price. Kennedy, Kennedy fired both, both, both of them. And I suppose um, that invasion um, created its own problems because uh, the Cubans then were afraid that Kennedy was going to have a second, uh, a, 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 a second invasion, or maybe a, 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 a second, a, a second pop at them as such, and that led to um, it led directly to the Cuban Missile Crisis because uh, the Cubans, in, in, to defend themselves, they invited the Soviets to put nuclear missiles. In, in Cuba, 90 miles from American shore, 90 miles from the shore of America, nuclear nuclear, nuclear missiles. And of course, when um, the U-2, the U-2 plane, American U-2 plane became aware of this and became aware of uh, that there were uh, ballistic, nuclear ballistic missiles on Cuban soil, um, we had what became known as the Cuban, Cuban Missile Crisis. And for 13 days, there was a standoff between the U.S. and the U.S. Uh, the, the USSR, there was a blockade around Cuba, and uh, there was a real fear. It's possibly the closest that the world had come to a nuclear a nuclear holocaust, and it could have slipped. Uh, it could have slipped into uh, such a, a, a dire situation for for humanity. And credit to Kennedy, I think uh, um, Jeffrey Sachs, the economist, says that we owe our very lives to JFK's grace under pressure in October. Uh, 19, 19, 1962. And um, um, what Kennedy did, he learned, uh, as a great leader does, he'd learned from the mistakes that he made in the Bay of Pigs. Um, before the Bay of Pigs, um, he maybe trusted what the military uh, were telling him, to, uh, military advisors were telling him too much. But this time, he was skeptical of any advice he got. He second guessed during the Cuban Missile Crisis. He second guessed every piece of information that he got from the intelligence agencies. Um, he was less inclined to listen to the hawkish approach of the military. And some of the military were more than willing to say, we need to strike first here. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, you strike first in a nuclear war, there's going to be a retaliatory strike. And I mean, uh, civilians, and, uh, civilians and mankind are going to pay a huge price. And Kennedy, did everything he could to seek a diplomatic solution, and that maybe wasn't easy for him with his with with with, with, with his background and his baggage, because his father in the Second World War and the run up to the Second World War and what had cost his father his political career was that he was somebody who was seen as soft, that he was somebody who didn't face up to aggression and had pursued a policy of appeasement. Yeah. And during the Cuban Missile Crisis, certainly some in the military felt that. Uh, Kennedy was going down the same route of appeasement as his father had gone uh, had gone gone through, but Kennedy was determined um, to broker a, dipl a diplomatic uh, solution, and he does. He brokers a solution uh, with he brokers a solution with Castro, where he gives an undertaking. Kennedy gives an undertaking that the U.S. will never invade the island of Cuba. In return, um, the Russians withdraw the missiles from Cuba from 90 miles from. Uh, American shore. And in a secret agreement that only came out 25 years later, uh, Kennedy actually removed American missiles from Turkey, which were close to, uh, obviously close to the Ru Russian borders. Uh, so he, do he does that deal. And afterwards, um, he's, I suppose, totally changed by that experience that he could have been the man who put his finger on the nuclear trigger. And he realizes um, that the world has to, uh, he has to make a world where um, to coexist with the, with the communists, with, with, with the communists, because the alternative in the 1960s is another crisis like this and the potential for, for, for a nuclear war. So from the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis on, but particularly um, from the summer of 1963 on, um, Kennedy starts making, pursuing essentially what is a peace strategy. He talks about the USR, the USSR and the USA having a mutual interest in avoiding mutual uh, destruction. Um, and he begins to send back channels 
uh, to Cuba. In September 1963, he sent a man called William Atwood, uh, who was two years below him in, in prep school, who, who he knew. William Atwood, uh, Atwood was uh, an official who worked for Adley, Adlai Stevenson at the United Nations. And he sent William Atwood uh, to Cuba uh, to create a back channel to, to Castro to see can they broker uh, good relationships and can they broker an understanding. Um, later on, in November 1963, uh, that fateful month, Kennedy has actually sent another emissary to, uh, to Cuba, a man called Jean Daniel, who's a French journalist and a socialist who was going to Cuba. And Kennedy sends, uh, Kennedy talks to him before he goes to Cuba, gives him a message for Castro in terms of that Kennedy is interested in having talks with Castro in terms of the possibility of coexistence and how uh, Cuban and American relations uh, can be improved. At the same time, he's thinking about his second term, uh, and he's thinking about detente with the United with the USSR. He tells uh, David Ormsby Gore, who is the British ambassador in the United States, but also happens to be a personal friend of President Kennedy's from uh, his earlier life when Pe Kennedy spent some time living in London when his father was ambassador, and he was friendly with a young David Orm Ormsby Gore. But Kennedy tells him in the summer of 1963. He's going to go to Moscow in a second term. He's going to make a presidential visit to Moscow, and he wants to broker better relations with the Soviets. Um, he sells grain to the Soviets uh, in that summer of 1963. There's a, there's a major drought in the USSR, and Khrushchev has a problem in terms of uh, there's a grain shortage in the USSR, and Kennedy sells grain to the Russians. Um, some people in the Republican Party, including Barry Goldwater, who is already facing up at this stage, thinks he's going to, uh, face up to face up to Kennedy in the 1964 presidential election. He's apoplectic about the notion of Kennedy giving a helping hand uh, to Khrushchev and, and to the Soviets by selling them grain. For Kennedy, uh, it's a no-brainer. One, it helps the USSR, or sorry, one, it helps the USA with their balance of payments. But two, more importantly for Kennedy, it's a gesture of goodwill to the USSR and his way of maybe building a, 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 another, another bridge towards them. Within his own administration, even, there's criticism uh, of Kennedy giving this helping hand to Khrushchev. And Lyndon Johnston is privately very, very critical of Kennedy doing this. Uh, Richard Nixon, uh, who was his opponent in the election of 1960, as Donica spoke about, Nixon also says that this is a mistake. Uh, to sell the grain to the USSR. But Kennedy thinks that this is something that he's going to bag goodwill here as he moves towards a peace strategy. He's also thinking uh, in this summer of 1963 in terms of China. And he tells uh, Roger Hillsman, who is um, the Under Secretary of State for Far Eastern Affairs, that um, he wants to bridge, build a bridge towards China in terms of open the door with China a little bit in terms of the second term, uh, his second term, and again is thinking about the possibility of visiting uh, China. As we know, there is no second term for, for, for JFK, and it's actually not until the early 70s before an American president, and that president being Richard Nixon, actually visits uh, uh, China, and, uh, and that we have the beginning of detente, detente there as well. But Kennedy is already thinking about this way. This way, How does he make the, the world safer? So this is a big shift from somebody who comes in office as very much a cold warrior. And I think the big shift in Kennedy's uh, thinking happens after um, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And he begins to he begins to move move toward move towards move towards peace. So um, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Donica. Well, just briefly, because as um, as Elizabeth mentioned in her introduction, I, I also focus a lot in my my research on the uh, former Soviet Union, and I lived in the former Soviet Union for for the better part of a decade, and I've spent more time, I guess, lecturing about Nikita Khrushchev than even John F. Kennedy. And in that respect, it's important to point out. I guess a few things. One is that Nikita Khrushchev did what many others had done in the past, and that he underestimated John F. Kennedy, uh, just as Lyndon Johnson had done, just as Henry Cabot Lodge had done. And as you mentioned, the Bay of Pigs was a disaster, and it, it emboldened Khrushchev. It, it reinforced a view that he had uh, when Kennedy took office, that this was a man who had got there because of, uh, solely on his father's uh, largesse, and, mm -hmm. and was a man of substance, and could be bullied. 
uh, quite uh, and 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 Kennedy, you know, played a blinder in the Cuban Missile Crisis. It's a wonderful um, demonstration of that when they get a, a, a rather um, cooperative telegram from Nikita Khrushchev, and they're they're trying to decide how to deal with it, and then it's followed up by a very hostile and aggressively. Uh, worded telegram and and they they are absolutely in a bind to know what has happened they even think there may have been a coup in moscow so different is the tone uh, of the two telegrams and eventually they come to the decision uh which i think is a remarkably clever one in in all situations we might apply to our own daily lives in many respects that they simply ignore the second telegram and reply to the first one and <laughs> and, and it works it works yeah. the, the soviets calm down and and um you know it 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 it, it, it kind of again diverts uh, tension at a critical moment. I should also say that when Kennedy was assassinated in 1963, the Soviets, you might remember that the Soviets um, were initially, uh, you know, a potential uh, scapegoat for what happened. And, and they had to prove uh, to, to the American people and to the American government that they weren't behind it, because, of course, Lee Harvey Oswald had lived in the Soviet Union for two years. Um, he was only 24 years of age when he died, but two of those years had been spent in the Soviet Union. I visited the apartment that he stayed in, in Minsk, in Belarus, uh, for those two years. And what they had done is that the KGB had bugged the apartment because they didn't trust Oswald. They didn't trust that he wasn't an American agent. So they made sure they knew everything that he was saying and doing, every argument that he had with his wife, uh, who's still alive, by the way, uh, and living in the United States, but every argument was recorded, and they passed those tapes on to the American government and said, look, this is what Oswald was doing in the Soviet Union. You know, he wasn't plotting with us. And, and also, just one other um, anecdote, which is uh, probably largely unfamiliar to many people, is that I actually interviewed the man in Belarus who was Oswald's um, language instructor. Um, so the man who taught him Russian, uh, not very well, Oswald wasn't particularly adept at languages, but he, he and, and, and his instructor had no English, um, that didn't help, but he was hoping that he would be immersed in the language, and his, his name was a man called Stanislav Shushkevich, I interviewed him for two hours about ten years ago, and what's, why I interviewed him wasn't because he was the man who taught Oswald while he was in, uh, in, in the Soviet Union, was because he went on to much greater things, he became the first president of, of independent Belarus. Um, Belarus, of course, has been in the news in recent times. Uh, Alexander Lukashenko, of course, been in power for 27 years. But his immediate predecessor as head of state was a man called Stanislav Shushkevich, who, is, as I said, uh, when Oswald was in the Soviet Union, was entrusted in the factory that he was working to train uh, Oswald in the Russian language. So there's a lot of interesting trajectories there. But the Soviet Union does play a major role in, in of course, John F. Kennedy's uh, presidency, because, of course, it was in the heart of the Cold War. And the Cold War was the foreign policy issue. But as Brian rightly points out and eloquently demonstrates in his chapter, there was an evolution at play. John F. Kennedy, you know, uh, was, was always open to advice and, and always willing to learn. And that was, I think, demonstrated in the uh, thousand days of his presidency. Yeah. Well, and I think that's something, um, and maybe both of you can speak to this, like how much of it, I've kind of got two questions, how much of it is in his blood? We, we spoke earlier on a bit about the father, and, and I have to say, you know, every now and then I post about the Kennedys, you know, like the sixth was RFK's and assassination, God love him, and Pete Hamill had a beautiful essay about it because he was a witness there, I believe he was kind of involved in the campaign. Um, Pete Hamill that died last year, the journalist. Um, so the so the father still elicits massive reaction. Like sometimes, you know, I, I, we get kind of nasty comments on the page, like <laughs> about the father, you know, which like I'm not responsible for the Kennedys, you know. Um, but then you look at somebody like Honey Fitz and, and sort of that background. And, and as I say, like Kennedy, you know, the lion of the Senate and himself and Tip O'Neill and a few more of them, you kind of wonder, like, where is that statesmanship that could be? you know, could a Ted Kennedy or a Tip O'Neill cope with what's happening today when even, you know, like a politician like Manchin, who's, and I don't know how closely you guys are following American politics, but Manchin is, you know, sort of trapped because maybe of, of his territory there in West Virginia, although apparently uh, they're saying now that the voting rights in particular, you know, that bill is actually quite popular in his district, but, you know, he doesn't want to get rid of the filibuster. So, um so my question was one part about like the legacy that Kennedy himself grew up with and, and the brothers and how they sort of uh, change and, and add to American politics. And then the, the last question that I'll ask is, um, oh God, what was I going to ask? Oh, about Ireland, you know, how the Irish people, you know, have a 
funnily enough, a, a photo of the Pope and a photo of JFK up, um, and the connections with Ireland and, you know, why you chose the writers that you did, because I, I see, like, Obama's speech writer, you know, has written an essay in there, and Bernie Sanders, uh, there's something to do with Bernie Sanders, so maybe the legacy that Kennedy has left, is that more the progressive wing of the party, the, the likes of, you know, Bernie Sanders or AOC? And then we'll open it to the floor then. Just, yeah, there, 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 there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot there, Elizabeth. I mean, uh, what what you say about um, uh, JFK's father and, and and people's views on, on, on him, and uh, you know, uh, and maybe certainly, I think there'll be warmer feelings in Ireland and I think in Irish America uh, towards JFK than than to, towards his father. And uh, I, I mean, uh, I don't think uh, Joseph P. Kennedy felt any real uh, emotional connection to Ireland. Uh, and I think it was a generational thing. I mean, I, 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 I read, I, I've read a fair bit about uh, uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, uh, the, the, the brilliant uh, American writer, Irish, Amer uh, uh, Irish American writer. I'm not sure he'd like to be labeled that an Irish, uh, uh, an, an Irish American writer, the man who wrote, who wrote The Great Gatsby. And he was of, uh, he was of a, a, a similar age to uh, Joseph P. Kennedy, uh, there was a, there was a couple of years a, a couple of years in between them. But I think Irish Americans in that generation uh, were very much striving to be accepted as full Americans. And uh, Joseph P. Kennedy was once quoted as saying uh, he was described in the newspapers as a, a, a as an Irish American or, a, or an Irish man, and uh, that wasn't something he took kindly to. Uh, he was quoted as saying. I was born here, my parents are born here, what the F do I have to do to be called an American? And he didn't like this idea of being seen as a hyphenated, a hyphenated, a hyphenated American. He wanted to be accepted as a full American. And F. Scott Fitzgerald, who I mentioned there as well, from reading about him, he didn't like the idea of being seen as an Irish American either. He wanted to be seen as uh, as, 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 a, as a full American. And that may re reflect the struggle of, you know... Um, well, during uh, World War I, like, there was a massive anti-hyphen, you know, Teddy Roosevelt going on the tear, and so there was a huge pushback against hyphenism in the very early 20th century. That maybe there, the there, was, there was a pushback against hy hyphenism, and also, I mean, I suppose the struggle in terms of uh, Irish people or Irish-American people to be recognised as... Uh, as, as as Americans, I mean, uh, jo Joseph P. Kennedy was offered um, the ambassador the ambassadorship, the U.S. ambassadorship to, uh, to to Dublin. Himself and his wife discussed it, and they'd no they'd no interest in uh, becoming uh, the ambassador to Ireland. So there wasn't a sentimental feeling for the old Sarge. Uh, he eventually uh, holds out, and he eventually gets um, ambassador to uh, the United Kingdom. And uh, as the the grandson of famine immigrants presents his uh, credentials to uh, King George VI in, in Buckingham Palace, but he didn't feel that pull towards towards the old side. JFK himself being of a different generation, he was genuinely interested in his Irish heritage. Uh, I mean, he, would, he, he had visited Ireland a number of times before that iconic visit in, in, in 1963. He first came in, he, he first came in 1939 um, and he was actually traveling back from London where his father was based, uh, where, where his father was based as the, uh, as the US ambassador in, in Britain. And he was traveling back and actually flew into, flew into Foynes and flew, up, flew from Foynes then onto the United States. So that was very much just a passing vi visit. But in 1945, he came, he came to Ireland after having served in the war himself and be, be, being injured in, 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 the, in the war and being a war hero. Um, by 1945, Kennedy was working briefly as a journalist for the Hearst Group, and he actually comes to Britain uh, to cover the British general election in, in 1945, the election that ousted Churchill just after just after World War II. But Kennedy decides he's going to go over to Ireland. He's curious about what's going on in Ireland, and he actually gets to Ireland and he uses his father's connections to interview De Valera about De Valera's stance during World War II, and particularly about De Valera's views about the partition of Ireland in 1945. And then he comes back to Ireland again in 1947, uh, essentially on a three-week holiday. Um, 
he, his, his sister-in-law, Kathleen, was married to a British ar aristocrat, the, the Duke of Devonshire, who owned uh, Lismore, Lismore Castle, Castle in the south, in the southeast of Ireland. And she was staying there. And, and JFK came over to stay with her uh, for three weeks. And um, he traveled around. Uh, he traveled around Ireland quite a bit in that period. And he made his first trip uh, to New Ross and to Dungan'stown uh, to the farm where his uh, great uh, grandfather had, emigra ha had emigrated from. And he felt that that was a, a magical uh, a experience to see, uh, I suppose, the old sod where his great uh, grandfather ha had, had emigrated from. And then again, he visited Ireland in uh, 1955. By this stage, he was a, he he was a senator and uh, it, it was a private visit, but he did speak at All Hallows Seminary, um, which is on the north side of Dublin, and he spoke there about the position of the Catholic Church in Communist Poland. He'd actually been on a, a visit. Uh, JFK had been on a Senate fact-finding mission to Poland, and he spoke at the seminary about how Catholics were being treated in, in, in Communist uh, uh, po Poland. And then, of course, he made the famous visit in, 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 in 1963. Uh, as a senator, he did uh, put down motions about partition in the US Senate, but they may have been uh, designed as much with uh, Irish American voters in mind as uh, maybe any genuine interest in it. But I think the visit to Ireland in 1963, the warmth of the reception that he received uh, in Ireland, it made a huge uh, in, in, impression on him. Um, he, uh, when he left Ireland, and I always find this, uh, I, I, I maybe hand over to Donica at this point, but I always find this uh, fascinating. When he left Ireland in 1963, Kennedy for the last time, and he told family members afterwards when he got back to the US that his days in Ireland were the happiest days of his life. He played, he played home movies of um, the video footage of him or the, the, the film footage of him in Ireland. He played those constantly at weekends to his family. He really, really immersed himself in the Irish experience. But as he was leaving Ireland, uh, leaving Shannon, he said, this is not the land of my birth, but it is the land that I hold the greatest affection for. Uh, and I will come back in the springtime. And I've often thought, I mean, that's an extraordinary quote in many ways. Of course, we all know he didn't come back in the spring, in the springtime, sadly, because of uh, events in Dealey Plaza in, 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 in Dallas. But um, the other part of that quote, this is the land that I have the greatest affection for. And I think it's extraordinary that uh, how much the Irish had, had maybe been accepted in the United States at that stage, that an American president could say, that this is not the land of my birth, but it is the land that I have the greatest affection for. And that there wasn't an outcry that people in America were saying, hang on, he's saying he loves Ireland more than the United States. And it may have been a bit of hyperbole as he was leaving, but he was genuinely talking about that affection for Ireland. And I've often wondered if Barack Obama, when he was president, if Barack Obama, when he had visited Kenya, if he had said leaving Kenya, this is not the land of my birth, but the land that I have the greatest affection for. What the reaction in US in, in the US would be at that stage. And I think maybe that says something about American politics having becoming more polarized. But I think if Barack Obama had said that leaving Kenya, I think there would have been an outcry from some people. It probably would have fed into this whole birther movement that was out there as well. Uh, and, and maybe uh, and maybe Either other issues that are even more malignant that, malignant than that, and says something maybe about the polarization of Amer of American politics. But um, I thought that was extraordinary that Kennedy said that. He did say um, that he was going to do. Uh, he told William V. William V. Shannon, who was uh, a, a very respected uh, American journalist and an American writer, and who was a friend of JFK's, based in Boston. Uh, and William V. Shannon was actually the person who had authored the celebrated speech that Kennedy made to the Irish Parliament when he visited in 1963. And Kennedy told him when he came home, he said, I'm going to do big things for Ireland in my second term. Um, we're not sure what those big things were, but um, it's, you know, maybe one of those big what ifs of his history in terms of what would it have meant uh, for Ireland if Kennedy had lived in a, uh, and, uh, and a second term, which I think inevitably he, he would have won. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah Donica, do you want to chime in? 
Just briefly, yeah, there's, there's, I mean, there's no doubt that he enjoyed the trip uh, to Ireland in 1963. He, he basked in the adulation and he, he made that clear to, to Sean Lamassa, then Taoiseach. I mean, when he was in America, he was always aware that when he met crowds of people, that probably half the people out there hadn't voted for him. But, you know, when he met people in Ireland, there was that genuine consensus, uh, enthusiastic yeah. consensus behind him. Nobody was asking for anything. He made no declaration of policy when he was in Ireland. There were no initiatives. He was just uh, happy uh, to be there in the land from whence he came and, and, and happy to bask, as I said, in the adulation. Arguably more important was the reaction, it, or, you know, the, the impact it had on Ireland. Uh, because mm -hmm. Ireland, of course, during the 1960s was coming out of a very difficult period of international isolation. It, it had just uh, a few years earlier joined the United Nations belatedly. Um, you know, the European economic community didn't exist, it had left the Commonwealth. Um, it, 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 was, it, was, it had abandoned protectionism and was now uh, trying to, to enter the economic framework of the international community. So there was a certain kind of um, importance attached to the most powerful person in the world uh, expressing this strong connection uh, with his ancestral homeland. And also uh, there was, as, as Tommy Kiernan, the, the, the Irish ambassador to the US put it at the time, it was also a, a symbolic coming of age, bringing kind of the awful chapter of the famine to an end. Um, you know, that, that, that certain arc, which as Brian pointed out, starts with Patrick Kennedy setting out in 1848 from Ireland, kind of ends in 1963. Uh, with John F. Kennedy, uh, you know, as the most powerful man in the world, coming back uh, to Wexford uh, from where his his his, his ancestors had come, and in, in, in and and coming back in, in a very different way. And and I, I I'm old enough to remember because again, there's a certain symmetry for me between uh, 1963 and and 1978 when Pope John Paul II visits Ireland. Uh, sorry, 1979 it was, not 1978. Uh, I, I, I saw him as a child at Shannon Airport departing Ireland. But what I remember then as well was, again, there was a certain, you know, simplicity to the event um, that, you know, afterwards, everything became very complicated, uh, as, as people know well, in, in relations with the Catholic Church in the 1980s and the 1990s were, uh, uh, you know, decades of, of, of decline for the Catholic Church in, in, in many respects. But, but at, in 1979, all that was eclipsed with the enthusiasm for the visit of John Paul the first, uh, the second rather, and it was the first visit of any pope to Ireland. Similarly, with, with, in 1963, Kennedy coming to Ireland, the, you know, it, 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 the first president to do so, and again with the connections there uh, with Ireland, it, it eclipsed all the other things that you might say, and we don't emphasize them, I guess, particularly in talks like this sometimes, but the things that divided Ireland from America, um, you know, in so many different ways, that this this somehow was forgotten, and 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 essentially at, for that moment in time when he was here, Ireland and the United States were at one, um, and uh, and as I said, it, it, it arguably became more complicated uh, since then. There's certainly never been a trip like that since. We've had American presidents who've come afterwards. Some of them have been heavily publicized, like uh, like Bill Clinton's uh, frequent visits, uh, Obama's, some less so. Uh, George uh, George W. Bush's uh, trip in 2003, or Richard Nixon's in 1970, but I think none none really parallels with that genuine enthusiasm uh, that 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 Kennedy managed to arouse in 1963. Mm -hmm. Well, guys, I think that was great. I want to throw it open to the floor. The floor is we we have a Zoom and a Facebook audience. Um, uh, you know, I, the book, I should tell everyone, we and I thank you, Brian, for mentioning it at the start because I was a bit topsy turvy. Um, we will have copies coming in this week. So, you know, I can send them to our members there. <laughs> we'll do a flat rate. Uh, you know, it's better to support us than to support Amazon. Um, but uh, so we'll have the book. But it's a series of essays, you know. So, as I say, Barack Obama's speechwriter, one of them, it, it, it's not uh, an itinerary of Kennedy in in Ireland, it's, it's the legacy, the, the political legacy. So there's a range of essays from Irish historians and commentators, as well as American uh, kind of pundits. So it's a great book. And uh, thank you both very much for, for coming in and for talking about it. So we thank kind you. of only touched the tip of the iceberg, really, you know, with this. But does anyone there on, on Zoom or Facebook have a talk? If, if there's Facebook people want to write it in the chat, I'll read them. <laughs> And Zoom, you can unmute yourselves if you'd like, or you can use the Q&A function. Nobody has a question or comment? <laughs> uh, 
You don't have, okay, no comments. I don't believe it. <laughs> um, all right, well then we'll leave it there. I, I'll get back to my emergency shark vacking or wet vacking, whatever the hell it's called with this five inches of water that we have going on. I'm amazed how quiet our members are. You're not normally quiet like this. But uh, thank you, Donica and Brian. I'm delighted to have met you virtually. Uh, and we will definitely have you both back about, you know, Brexit or, or these other kind of things. As I was saying to Brian today, we mark the centenary, you know, of the 1921, 22 events. So we're... Um, we're oh Rita, good girl. Okay, <laughs> Rita has I a raised just, hand. <laughs> well, I just wanted to thank them both for giving the lecture and and to you, Dr. Stack. Um, I I find everything about the Kennedys just fascinating. I was a young girl when he was assassinated, and my parents just you know because he was Catholic and Irish. I mean, it was just he was like like you know like you said pictures of you know we had the blessed heart of Jesus, and there was Kennedy. You know, yeah. we still have his bus somewhere, you know, yes. I mean, so I mean, he was such a legacy, I know, in our, my own family. So yeah. I really got a lot out of this and I look forward to reading the book. So I just yeah, I think you will enjoy the book. You. Yeah, right. and like we'll mark it on our Facebook page too when he does go, you know, I, I'll try to do that to track it. And of course, as I say, it was RFK's assassination on the 6th. Um, definitely, I, I think for Irish American and for Irish at home, you know, it was it really was a kind of a, oh my God, we've arrived. You know, like we, we suffered so much. I think his presidency gave a sort of a legitimacy. You know, Ireland had possibly always felt a little bit sorry for itself. And, you know, it had been kept out of the United Nations for a while, as Donica kind of mentioned there. You know, we weren't a big player on the world stage, like even though we were in every corner of the world. So I, I think Kennedy kind of gave Ireland, you know, this sense of pride in themselves that they maybe had not had, you know, until that point. And I think that trickled into the Irish American population too. And, um, I mean, he did, he, he did, Elizabeth, uh, I, I mean, he gave us a, a sense of status when yeah. he came. I mean, here was uh, the leader of the free world, and he took four days out of his itinerary to come to Ireland, which, uh, let's be honest, I'm, I'm a proud Irish man, but Ireland was a, a backwater, in, it, it, very yeah. much a backwater in the 1960s. And when he was making this European uh, trip, because the, the, the European trip for the summer of, of 1963, he was going. He was going to Germany, um, you know, and the, the serious Cold War business there. And he made that famous "Ich bin ein Berliner" speech there. Yeah. Um, he was. He was going to go to the UK um, to uh, talk to Harold Macmillan, his main ally in in, in Europe, about uh, getting ready for a nuclear test ban treaty and how they were going to negotiate with this with the so Soviets. And he was going to Italy. He was going to visit NATO headquarters in Italy as well. And he said, um, to, he said to his advisors, "I want to go to Ireland as well." Uh, as well. And one of his advisors, uh, Kenny O'Donnell, uh, and with a name like O'Donnell, uh, you can imagine where Kenny O'Donnell's um, uh, ancestors came from. So Kenny O'Donnell was an Irish American as well. But Kenny O'Donnell was a fairly hard-nosed um, political operative, and he said, "Mr. President, you don't need to go to Ireland. You've got every Irish vote there is in America." Uh, and he said, yeah. you really don't need to do this. And if you go to Ireland, people will say that it's a pleasure trip. And he's, uh, and Kennedy turned around to him and said, uh, Kenny, let me remind you, I am the president of the United States. And if I want to go to Ireland on a pleasure trip, I'm going to go to Ireland on a pleasure trip. And I want to go to Ireland. Yeah. Uh, so he insisted on going. I mean, the Irish government were very keen. Initially, when he came in as president in 1961, he was inaugurated. The Irish government actually held off asking him because they were afraid that he wouldn't come and that mm. would be an embarrassment uh, or they didn't want to be seen to put pressure on. But by 1962, they start moving towards an invitation. And, and Tommy Kiernan, who, who, who was the ambassador that Dunnick mentioned, he was very much uh, involved in this. But Kennedy was determined to come. And he could have come in for 24 hours, uh, uh, you know, and uh, really, uh, you, you, you know, uh, I, I suppose made, made it a short trip. But he gave four days to Ireland and he didn't condescend Ireland as well, actually. Uh, um, it, we, we quote in the, the introduction uh, to the book, um, the current Irish Prime Minister, uh, the Gaelic term we use for our Prime Minister, our, our Taoiseach, uh, Michal Martin, um, he spoke at the Kennedy Summer School and he spoke about the significance of that uh, visit. And uh, Taoiseach uh, is himself a historian. He's, uh, he's, uh, he's, he studied history in UCC and uh, published a very, very good book himself on Irish, Irish history. But he, he, he argued 
in that speech that he said the significance of Kennedy's visit was not just that he came, not just that you know he came for the period he did, but that he didn't condescend us. I mean, he came to the, he came before the Irish Parliament. He was the first foreign statesperson to address the Irish Parliament since independence, and he made a really significant speech, not just about shamrocks and shillelaghs and uh, mm -hmm. shamrocks and shillelaghs and kissing the old sod and leprechauns or any of uh, any of that kind of paddy paddy whackery. I mean, he made a significant speech about Ireland's place in the world. He made a significant speech about where the world was at this time and and the struggle between East and West and. Uh, his his efforts in terms of uh, world peace as well, and it's a it's a really really significant speech. So again, uh, you know, he he took Ireland he took Ireland seriously, and again, it's, I I think it's one of those what ifs of history if Kennedy had lived. Um, mm. I think it would have been a great I think it would have been a great thing because um, he was always interested in the, his Irish roots. But after that visit uh, to Ireland, uh, he certainly uh, seemed to be very interested in. Uh, doing things, doing things for Ireland, but um, there you have it. Mm. Yeah, well, uh, you know, you have left us wanting more, which is good. <laughs> we'll all have to read the book. Um, but thank you both very much. I want to just quickly mention we have Yates's birthday on Sunday at two o'clock, which will be a live event. We'll definitely be able to Facebook it because if we hold it outside in the courtyard, my internet, you know, I can do it on my phone. But if it's uh, we might not be able to zoom it is what I'm saying so it'll be live on Facebook for sure but I don't know if we'll be zooming that one yet and then on Monday the 14th we have Brad Edmondson who's written a book about the Adirondacks so not a super Irish focus on that at all but a kind of an environmental and the state the state parks and the Adirondack uh, region and then you know we'll talk about the rest of the month later on so Donica and Brian thank you both very much I thought this was fantastic um you know, we're so proud of the Kennedys, I suppose, that, that uh, I'm interested to read the book because there is a legacy beyond even Ireland, you know, and I think there's probably some lessons for modern America in there, too, in terms of statesmanship and rhetoric and, uh, you know, the speeches, the whole thing. So uh, and, and governance, you know, how, how to how to actually govern. <laughs> And, 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 and thanks to you, Elizabeth, because I, I know uh, you're, you're dealing with you're dealing with a flood there and a, and a yeah. crisis as well. So uh, uh, thanks for thanks for going ahead uh, with, with everything and uh, for, for for steering the conversation. Although you you may have a a foot or two of water there as well. Hope, I my ankles get, are freezing. <laughs> and my toes are you, wrinkly. <laughs> I hope you get that sorted out. And, and yeah, thanks, thank to, thanks to all thanks to all your audience for for for. for uh, for tuning in, I see some I see some good Irish names there as well on the on, on the list of participants as well. So. I, know. <laughs> I found it very enlightening the tracing through of um, a time period with the Kennedys when I was growing up as a kid yeah. and adolescent and oh. and the influence of um, Ireland on I believe our politics in general. Very very yeah. enlightening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. thank you, Betty. Thank you. Okay, and we'll definitely have you back because we're, you know, we are going to be all about Brexit and partition and Scottish independence of the whole shebang. So, uh, be prepared for a call in the fall. <laughs> Delighted. So good. Delighted. Good. Okay. Thanks, good luck, everybody. everyone. Good night. Thank Take bye care. Bye. Thank bye God bye. the rain has stopped. Take care. Bye bye. Bye, -bye. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. I'm glad you got bye -bye. on. Bye -bye. Good.